through FOI, but also quite crucially, although in a delayed way, uh, they, can, they should be held account for everything that they do through the documents being released by the National Archives. Now, for a long time, we had a 30 year rule in relation to the release of documents. Now that's been progressively reduced to 20 years, which is a good thing. The flaw in the process, however, is that these documents are not immediately released after 20 years. Uh, in fact, you have to ask the National Archives to open a particular file. The file is then vetted for any material that needs to remain secret by um, the relevant public service department. Uh, the National Archives then makes a decision and the file may or may not be released either in its entirety or with redactions or with large numbers of documents removed. Now, the first problem here is one of timing. The process can take a very long time. And I don't mean just weeks or even months, but sometimes years. Um, I requested some documents in January 2012 for a book I was writing. By the end of 2012, I was quite annoyed that I didn't have the documents. I even went as far as complaining to the Ombudsman. The Ombudsman said, I don't have jurisdiction to deal with that. And that's indeed one of the failings of the whole system. There's very little accountability um, in relation to the National Archives. In the end, all you can do is go to court as Jenny Hocking has shown. Um, and so the, the Ombudsman couldn't do anything. And how long did I end up waiting for the documents? Seven and a half years. So not surprisingly, the book had been well and truly written, published and reviewed by the time I got access to the documents. Um, and you know, that's just appalling because the, the really annoying thing at the end of this is when I did go and look at the documents, there was actually stuff in there that would have been really useful for the book. But the book once written, you know, most books once written, that's the end of it. That's the history. The history is being written by that point because mostly they never come back in second or third editions. Okay, so the, the Australian Archives causes us to lose our history because history ends up being written before people can end up getting the documents that should be informing it. Um, this isn't just my story. Um, it's a story of countless scholars, um, particularly those who are interested in government uh, who have had this problem as well. It's particularly a story for people doing um, higher degrees like PhDs. If you start your PhD and it's dependent on getting documents from the National Archives, you may end up have been, having done two PhDs by the time the documents are released. Um, what is the consequence of that? It's a really bad consequence. And that is that people just do not do that kind of research in Australia because the risk is too high that they will not get access to government documents. And so our PhD students are going overseas to do archival research in other countries about their systems of government, simply because our own archives are too dysfunctional to be able to serve that need. Okay, so that's whinge number one. Um, I should just add to that though, delay is not just a consequence of lack of funding um, or even incompetence or poor management, although there's a little bit of that going around, but it can also be used as a weapon. It deters and delays the discovery of government documents. Um, it relies on people giving up um, or having lost the opportunity to present that um, information because the book is finished and done. Um, and so in that way, you can avoid, if you're the government and you have embarrassing documents out there, you can really avoid them actually ever being revealed or used just simply by using delay as a weapon. Okay, second major problem, and this is a key one here, is secrecy. Okay, so documents in the open access period should be released unless there are exceptional reasons like national security. The whole point of the 20 year rule or indeed the 30 year rule is that by that time, all the immediate reasons which justifiably allow for secrecy should have passed. That the Australian people should have the right to know what their governments have done in the past. And so these documents should be being released, but they're not. Uh, there is increasing paranoia in the public service and in the National Archives um, about releasing documents because it might well embarrass the government and that will then lead to some kind of blowback against the people who authorise it and they might lose their jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And the consequence of this is 
uh, that it is getting harder and harder every single year to access documents to which the Australian people should have access. Now, when the archive system was set up in Australia, the National Archives was allocated the role of vetting um, these files before they were released, rather than the public service um, departments on the basis that the National Archives would be more independent and um, uh, the public servants wouldn't be able to protect their own backs you know, from um, a release of things that were embarrassing. In practice, as far as I have seen, uh, what happens is that the National Archives ask the department for advice and then just complies with whatever they say. There doesn't seem to be any kind of pushback, any kind of independent scrutiny or assessment in terms of what the public servants say. So no matter how absurd the excuse is or the um, alleged use of an exemption, uh, the National Archives just swallows it. Um, and the consequence of that is that material is being kept secret, um, even when it doesn't satisfy the legal grounds for exclusion. So let me give you a couple of examples here. I was once denied access to a document on the ground that it would damage Australia's security and threaten Australia's sovereignty. And I thought, oh my God, what sort of document could do that? I mean, had they secretly got a contract where they sold Tasmania to the Russians or something or other? I mean, really? So I thought, okay, I'm gonna challenge this one because that's just ridiculous. Um, and so I did. And in this case, which is quite rare on internal review, they gave me the document. Now it was a very long document, it included a whole lot of other stuff. And I read it three times before I could work out what it was that was gonna threaten Australia's sovereignty. Well, in the end, I finally figured out there was a statement in it where an Australian diplomat, diplomat made a comment about some other countries claim to a bit of Antarctica saying they thought the claim was dodgy. Okay, it wasn't even to our part of Antarctica. It had nothing to do with Australia's sovereignty, national security, anything. It just had the word sovereignty in it. And some genius in the National Archives decided that was enough to exclude the application, exclude access to the entirety of the document. And when you see things like that, you just think honestly and truly how much stuff is being kept secret for no sane reason at all. Okay, so you might then be wondering, well, what relevance does this really have to government today if this is all sort of old stuff? So let me give you um, a, a couple of examples. The first one is the crisis concerning section 44 of the constitution. Now this really was a big deal for government and quite a number of members of parliament lost their jobs as a consequence. Now, I was commissioned by the Department of the Parliamentary Library to write a major paper explaining um, one of the Section 44 disqualifications, Office of Profit under the Crown. Now, being a good researcher, one of the first things I did was go to the National Archives, to their catalogue, to see what it was, uh, what, what sort of files were there. Now, this was really interesting because the jurisprudence, you know, from about, you know, from early on up until the Sykes and Cleary case in 1992, jurisprudence on Section 44 was really thin. There's hardly anything there. But what was really interesting is that there were dozens of files in the National Archives where the Commonwealth government had been dealing with these issues. It had been dealing with questions about um, dual citizenship and office of profit under the crown and all this sort of stuff. But it hadn't released them. And so we didn't know about this stuff. Um, so what did I do? Well, I asked for them to be released. Um, uh, there were files on um, all sorts of interesting things. There were files on the um, possible disqualification of candidates for being an officer of the state bank. This is from 1953. Um, uh, whether or not a member of the Australian Wheat Board in 1963 was disqualified. Um, there was stuff on um, members of the Commonwealth and Immigration Advisory Council in 1970. Uh, and there was lots of stuff on dual citizenship, like whether an Irish citizen should be, could be able to become a member of parliament. Um, if this material had been opened earlier and people had written about it, maybe we wouldn't have even had the Section 44 crisis. Uh, but what happened? Well, you probably guessed it. I asked for all these files. And I was told, no, you cannot have them. Um, either they were um, completely um, excluded, so they were closed from access, 
Now we're talking about things in the 1950s, 1960s and 1970s here, okay? <laughs> really long time ago. Either they were completely excluded from access um, or they were partially excluded from access. And that meant that they then gutted the entire file um, by taking out everything that had any substance in it and just leaving the administrative documents. Um, now, from my experience, um, that some of the stuff had already been opened, and that was pre-World War II and before, and that provided really useful material. So it told us things about, well, what if you have a commission in the armed forces, for example, does that disqualify you from being a member of parliament? What if you're a doctor who's serving in a hospital, which, by the way, is still an issue um, in relation to Section 44 today. But all the later stuff after about World War II was denied. Um, and on what basis did they deny it? Well, uh, they said there were legal advices in there um, and that they were privileged um, and that I couldn't have them. And um, the basis for that was section 33.2 of the Archives Act, which says that a document is exempt if it's subject to legal professional privilege and its disclosure is contrary to the public interest. Okay, so here's where the fight comes up. How was it contrary to the public interest for members of parliament and people who wanted to be candidates for parliament to know more about the circumstances in which they might be disqualified. I mean, clearly it was in the public interest for people to know about this, which was precisely why the Commonwealth Parliamentary Library asked me to write about this. So I was doing this for the Commonwealth, for the Commonwealth politicians, while the National Archives is telling me that I can't know about these things. I mean, the absurdity in it was just, you know, frankly, extraordinary. Um, this notion, so they said that one of the reasons was they said that, um, uh, let me just get the words, they said that releasing the documents could prejudice the legal position of the Commonwealth in the event of future legal proceedings and that the documents were subject to ongoing sensitivities. Okay, now, first of all, there were clearly never going to be any legal proceedings about someone who was a member of the Australian Wheat Board in sort of, you know, 1963. So all the stuff about people in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, where the people themselves were, by the way, dead um, uh, and were no longer members of parliament and you couldn't challenge their existence as a member of parliament, clearly there could be no direct litigation in relation to this. As for affecting future legal proceedings, well, to state the screamingly obvious, there had since been major legal precedents like Sykes and Cleary in 1992 and all the Section 44 cases recently. So anything that anyone advised before those dates was going to be appropriate and certainly not in any conceivable way binding on the Commonwealth, okay? It was just ridiculous. As for ongoing, ongoing sensitivities, um, this is just code for, oh dear, the government might be embarrassed. Is that a ground in a public interest test under the law? And the answer is no, it is not. Okay, so these documents are being um, kept by the National Archives secret without any substantial legal ground for doing so, at least in my view. Um, now I did seek internal review um, and of course I got the same rubbish coming back. Um, uh, so the only way of dealing with this would be to go to the AAT and then start taking legal proceedings. The filing fee alone is over $900. So if you don't have institutional backing to pay this stuff and you have to pay it out of your own pocket, not to mention the blood pressure um, aspect of it, um, uh, it's crazy to go further and um, challenge these things. And the archives knows that. And it relies on that. And that's how they get away with it. Uh, interestingly, when this happened, I happened to be called in by a Commonwealth minister to talk about something else. Um, and I raised this with the minister and I said, this is just completely bonkers. And he agreed. And he said he couldn't understand why the Commonwealth government was um, denying the access to these documents. So, and I think he was genuine. I, I think that the problem with this is it actually wasn't coming from above from ministers. It was coming from public servants who just didn't want a fuss to be made. It's just easier to keep everything secret so that you never have the risk of a fuss being made. Um, so what was in the documents that's so secret and damaging? Well, I don't really know for sure because I haven't read them, um, but my guess is that the thing they're trying to hide 
is that the government was aware that members of parliament were actually there who were disqualified and didn't do anything about it. That would be my guess, but I can't say for sure. Okay, second example um, is the Hocking case um, about the Kerr letters. I'm not gonna go into that in any detail because I'm guessing you all know about it. Um, uh, but it was always obvious from the very beginning that if a governor general in his capacity as governor general writes to the queen in her capacity as the queen about filling, fulfilling his official functions in dismissing a government, that is not going to be correspondence that's personal and private, okay? It is a public document because it's fulfilling his public role. This was a point that I had made for a long time, well before this litigation came into play. Um, fortunately, as we know, the High Court finally um, supported rationality and confirmed that view, uh, but only after a lot a lot of money was spent on the litigation. Now, shortly after those documents were released, I was waiting online to do a live television interview about it. And while I was waiting, I saw Anthony Albanese and um, another Labor minister, I can't remember who it was now, talking about how shocking it was that the government had refused access to these documents. And I have to say that rather riled me because some years earlier, I had actually written when Labor was in government to the Attorney General, pointing out why these were not personal and private documents and why the government should release them. Now that letter got passed around between various ministers until it ended up um, on the, in the inbox of Tony Burke, um, who then sent me the reply, which just reiterated all the tripe that the National Archives had told him to say. Um, saying that this, these were the personal and private records of Sir John Kerr and therefore I couldn't have them. Now, unlike the National Archives, I'm prepared to release those letters. So when I did my media interview, I pointed that out. Not long afterwards, Tony Burke rings me up. <laughs> He's pretty shocked because he had no idea that he had signed a letter to that effect. In fact, he couldn't even remember that he was in any way responsible for the archives. So it was a mystery to him. Um, uh, now, this, and, and it was certainly his, his signature on the letter, so it was his letter, but he had no recollection of it. Now, to me, this indicates another problem, and that is that the archives is such a low priority for ministers that they just, for example, sign letters that the archives writes for them without giving any independent oversight or any scrutiny to them. The archives can get away with pretty much anything because no one in government can is enough about it. And no one's looking over its shoulder, except when it comes to cutting their budget, which they do quite a bit. Um, in my view, however, should be regarded as an, and it does deserve funding and respect, but also critical scrutiny. Now, let me conclude with a final example um, last year, I was asked to deliver the Sir Maurice Byers lecture at the Supreme Court of New South Wales. Now, Sir Maurice Byers was Solicitor General from 1973 to 1983. So I decided to use my talk to analyse the legal opinions that he gave um, and their relationship to the politics of the day, which of course was quite interesting during that Whitlam period. Um, so Sir Maurice from 1973 to 1975 was the prime legal advisor to the Whitlam government. Uh, interestingly, the first volume of Sir Morris's opinions from 1973 to 1976, held by the National Archives, had already been opened to public access back in 2011. So I applied for the other volumes to be opened and I was pleasantly surprised uh, because in a timely fashion, unlike my other experiences, they were opened and without redaction. And I thought, great, the National Archives has actually learned something from the whole Hocking experience and is behaving in a more open manner and giving access to these documents. So I immediately arranged for someone in Canberra, because it was during COVID, um, to go and visit the archives and photograph them for me. Now, a couple of weeks later, I got an email from the National Archives saying, oh dear, someone hit the wrong button and these documents are all terribly secret and you can't have them. Well, this was interesting because I already did have them. They didn't seem to know that. 
and um, and I'd already read them. So what were the grounds upon which I couldn't have these documents? Well, it was contrary to the public interest to release them because, you guessed it, ongoing sensitivities, right? Now, again, this is a completely inadequate application of the public interest test. This time, because I had read all the opinions that had ongoing sensitivities, I can make an assessment as to how legitimate that claim was. Well, in my view, where the ongoing sensitivities were, were in volume one. That's the one they already released. That's the one that had all the really interesting stuff in it about the Whitlam government and advising the Whitlam government. The other two volumes weren't anywhere near as interesting or indeed as sensitive. So what was it that the archives was incompetently trying to hide from me? Well, there were some opinions that do touch on matters of relevance today, such as whether Commonwealth officers can be compelled to give evidence to a state royal commission, whether um, a GST would be constitutionally valid, uh, the legal basis for calling out the troops after the Hilton bombing. Uh, but as was the case in relation to the Section 44 documents, none of those legal opinions would actually be applicable or relevant in litigation today. And that is because so many other legal decisions and interpretations have been made by the court since that they are out of date. Historically, they are really interesting. In, and in terms of accountability of government, they are interesting too, because they tell you what happened. And they tell you when the Solicitor General advised the government to do X and it completely ignored him. So yes, they are interesting, but no, they could have no impact on um, current litigation and ongoing sensitivities. Uh, they do however provide a quite fascinating time capsule in relation to the past. Uh, there are also some other opinions which fell into the more eclectic area, uh, such as one about whether a law that prohibited unauthorized military drills would have the effect of banning marching girls. Yep, you can just see that's a really big issue today. Okay, so what was the embarrassing stuff that remained so sensitive and had to be hidden? In truth, I just can't see any basis for a public interest test in terms of keeping those two second volumes secret. My guess is that the source of embarrassment is the fact that sometimes the Solicitor General advises the government not to do something because it's likely to be unconstitutional. And then the government goes ahead and does it anyway. Governments don't really want you to know that they've been told what they're doing is unconstitutional. And they just said, don't care, doing it anyway. That certainly happened, particularly during the Whitlam government. Lionel Murphy wasn't so keen on legal advice saying that he shouldn't do constitutionally unconstitutional things um, and did go ahead um, and ignore the Solicitor General's advice. Indeed, Sir Morris Byer's very first opinion was completely ignored by the government. But that was all in volume one and volume one had been released. And by the way, the world had an end because it had been released. Uh, for any of you who are interested, by the way, if you want to see my Samaras Byers lecture, it's got some great stuff in it, particularly if you're interested in the Vince Guerra affair and the, light of, and the Night of the Long Prawns. Um, uh, so the actual talk is on um, YouTube somewhere with the New South Wales Bar Association. But if you look also for the written version, it's in New South Wales Bar News in their summer 2020 um, volume called uh, under the title of Sir Morris Byers Lecture 2020, and that's also online. So for anyone interested, you might want to have a look. My final observation is that the government's attitude to the National Archives is reflected in who it chooses to run it. Should it choose and did it choose a champion of free speech, of government accountability? No, it chose the Deputy Director General of ASIO, a person whose job it is to keep secrets. So not even the people in Yes Minister would have taken the joke that far. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. I agree that um, some of these jokes you couldn't make up, but that's a really good one. Um, Kate, your video has dropped down to your um, white, like elbow area. Can you lift your screen? Oh, there we go. Hi. <laughs>
Thanks so much, Anne, and that was a really great summary of some of the core issues around government information. Um, next, we're going to speak to Kate McClymont about the difficulties the media has in covering government information. Um, Kate McClymont is an investigative journalist at the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, she's won five Walkleys between 93 and 2012 um, and has been covering uncovering corruption, um, famous for the Eddie O'Bead scandal um, and uh, the salary cap scandal for the Canterbury Bulldogs and a range of other things in, that I'm sure um, uh, I have missed, but we're honoured to have Kate McClymont here and um, keen to hear her thoughts on some of the difficulties in, in media uncovering government information. Thanks, Kate. Thanks so much, Hannah. And um, thanks so much, Anne. I'm desperate to read Night of the, the Long Prawns. <laughs> that sounds absolutely amazing. Now, I just wanted to start by um, giving you an example of how things have improved. Now, in May 1990, and that is 31 years ago, my then um, colleague Marion Wilkinson and I wrote a story about the resignation of Labor's number one candidate on the New South Wales Senate ticket. Now, even though he had held the prime spot, most people had never heard of John Morris, who was also the head of the Liquor Trades Union. And it wasn't helped by the fact that he had been dubbed the silent senator by the opposition, given that he'd only given two speeches, yes, two speeches in his six-year parliamentary career. And one of those was his maiden speech. He missed 40% of the votes. He made no interjections. He missed a quarter of the meetings of the committee of which he was chair and he had been absent for 15% of government sitting days. Now, the silent senator was a ticking time bomb. For 20 years, the former bar steward had used the power of the liquor trades union to single-mindedly advance his political interests. But despite going to Canberra, Senator Morris refused to loosen his grip on the liquor union, staying on as a paid honorary president with a car on top of his Senate salary and expenses. And by 1989, his combined income from his two jobs was well over $110,000 a year. Now, given that the, a, a basic backbencher's salary is currently $211,000 without any travel allowance, add on the salary for a union boss, and you can imagine what a bloody good wicket the silent senator was on. Now, John Morris was living an extraordinarily affluent life, the flashy cars, expensive suits, and the amazing property portfolio. But here was the catch for anyone investigating his property holdings. In those days, you had to go in person to the Corporate Affairs Office in Castle Ray Street. You were allowed to search company records but you had to know the name of the company you were searching. And by that, I mean, you could not rock up and just ask to search John Morris's name to see what companies he had. You had to know the name of the company. Now, our problem was that he had hidden the property purchases in a company name. So our task was the modern day equivalent to cracking someone's password. Anyway, I came up with a genius idea the great love of John Morris's life, apart from money, was his greyhounds. So I did a, um, I went down <laughs> to the racing authority and found out that his most successful greyhound was one called Pied City. So I trotted down to corporate affairs, put in my order, waited a couple of hours until they dug out the microfish. I don't know whether anyone remembers those little rectangular pieces of plastic which you had to slide under a machine to read anyway bingo there was a company called pied city investments and morris had bought 23 properties across new south wales and the act including a third share in a private hospital one of the properties was sold in 1989 for 1 1.8 million on top of that, several members of Morris's family were employed by the LTU and his wife, Jill, was employed on his Senate staff. And guess what happened to John Morris as a result of our explosive revelations? 
absolutely nothing. He resigned as a senator after a six-year stint with his colleague John Button, the leader of the government in the Senate, quipping, I have not had the opportunity of knowing Senator John Morris well. Indeed, none of us have. But not only did he continue of, on the payroll of the union, but the Carr government appointed him head of the, yes, the Greyhound Racing Authority. And sadly, John Morris died suddenly at the Unibet Gardens Greyhound Racing Track in Newcastle in February 2013. And in his condolence speech to the Senate, Senator John Faulkner commented that there had been few kind words spoken about former Senator John Morris in this place. But it is also true, John Morris did not have many kind words to say about the Senate. He and the Senate were not a good fit. So the good thing is in that the 30 years that have passed since that investigation, access to government information has improved considerably. I can sit at my desk and find out who has what company, who the shareholders are, who the fellow directors are, what property holdings those companies might have. I can also access similar information from overseas. But the problem is it costs a lot of money. Many of my stories cost thousands of dollars in company searches. And only big media companies can actually afford to pay these very steep charges in order to do company and land title searches. And I think that is something that definitely should be looked at. I think those costs um, for you know, journalists doing that kind of research should be reduced which brings me to the courts. Now, with the reduction in the amount of journalists able to cover courts properly, like in the old days, we had a special reporter at the Herald whose only job it was was to cover the high court. Now we've got half the amount of journalists trying to do twice the amount of work. And I just think it would be such an enormous benefit if journalists were allowed access to court transcripts. And I look at, um, you know, when you cover things like the Independent Commission Against Corruption or Royal Commissions, they provide you access to their transcripts that same day. But if we try to do the same things trying to cover uh, courts here, it's impossible. The courts want to charge you up to $19.50 per page. And each day, um, you know, a, a court case might generate, generate hundreds of pages of transcripts. So it's just not economically viable to get transcripts at that cost. And, you know, I often marvel at the ability of American journalists to do the most amazing stories on court cases. But they're given access to, you know, say police audios, to transcripts, even recordings from the actual courtroom, which, you know, here is just not doable. But the other thing is, is that the, the delays in getting access to uh, information, okay, it's not quite the same as Anne's seven year delay in getting access, but um, I tried to get access to a coronial inquest that took place about um, a decade ago. And this was um, an amazing story about um, a young man named Max Gibson. And he and his criminal colleague were basically described as the, the dumb and dumber of the criminal world. And what had happened was that um, Max Gibson ha and his um, colleague had blown up a house that uh, a well-known colourful corporate Sydney identity was in the process of buying. But the thing was they got all their measurements wrong and Max Gibson blew off his bum cheek, which had his wallet in it, and police were able to trace um, his drops of blood back to the scene of the crime. Anyway, look, he was to give evidence. Um, he was charged with arson. And on the first day of his trial, or at the end of the first day of his trial, he disappeared. And after three days, they called the trial off and they found his body still in the suit that he'd been wearing that very same day that he'd appeared in court. And he died of 
a heroin overdose, but it was discovered that he'd injected himself in his left hand and he was left-handed. So anyway, at the coronial inquest, the uh, colourful Sydney uh, identity was one of those who was um, suspected of, you know, perhaps perpetrating his murder. Anyway, I put in an, um, uh, an access information um, at the beginning of last year. It took one entire year for them just to get out the files for that inquest. Now, whether it's um, understaffing, I don't know. But, you know, a year to get information is, you know, like it's it's pretty ridiculous. And, you know, things like when you go to apply for documents at the local court, you are actually allowed to look at the documents, but there's no photocopying allowed. You have to copy out information by hand. And I think in this day and age, that's pretty ridiculous as well. And look, certainly some courts are better than others. The federal court, I think, is really good at providing access to information. But even trying to get help from organisations such as ASIC is near on impossible. And I recently contacted the AFP just to see where a proceeds of crime application was up to. They politely informed me that because it was before the court, they couldn't help me. But that's exactly what I was asking them for. You know, where was it up to? And it often appears that, you know, government age agencies are so terrified of dealing with the media that their default position is to do absolute, absolutely nothing and to reject any request for help. And then that brings us to the freedom of information laws. Now, over the years, there's been considerable improvements to our freedom of information laws, but there are still massive flaws. It's expensive, it's time consuming, and ultimately it's unsatisfactory for many journalists and the public. Sometimes you get back a request, which is almost completely black due to the redactions for privacy reasons or commercial incompetence or the like. Um, several of the uh, Commonwealth Department's heads have argued in recent years that the Federal Freedom of Information Act should be amended to make it more difficult to scrutinise their advice to government. In 2016, the Department of Health Secretary Glenis Beecham said most FOI requests she saw came from journalists looking for a story. Now, this, commented high, this, sorry, this comment highlighted a common difference of opinion between people inside government who aren't happy about providing the information and those outside who are attempting to report on the inner workings of governments or their departments. Ms Beecham questioned whether journos looking for a story, as she described it, was the original intent of the legislation. To me, this showed a general failure to appreciate that journalists and citizens have a right to access information and to see how and why a decision has been reached. In New South Wales, at least, it is clear that most of the information requests public servants respond to are from people seeking their own information, followed by business people and journalists hunting around for a story barely rate. Now, this picture may look different at a federal level, but the same sort of breakdown isn't available. So in New South Wales, we have the government information public access legislation. And of course, government information means any information contained in a record held by a New South Wales government agency. Now, government information can include records and data about how a government agency works or your own personal information that is held by a government agency. Now, importantly, there is a presumption in favour of releasing this information, but it can be prohibitive. You're often quoted um, processing charges at a rate of $30 per hour. If you request an external review, that has to go to the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal, and you're given 40 days after the notice of the decision has been given to you. You also have 30 working days 
from the time the decision, the decision is given to you to ask for an internal review by the agency that has been made by, um, has rejected your decision. Now, I, I love all these things that um, the review must be carried out by an officer of no less senior than the person who made the original decision. But you can't ask for an internal review if a minister or their personal staff or the principal officer of an agency has made the decision. You have to go then to N NCAT. Now, in the last year, the 2018 to 2019 year, there were 15,774 valid applications. 75% of these were made by members of the public and most of these was for personal information. Interestingly, journalists accounted for only 3% of the applications and parliamentarians 2%. Now, another interesting figure was that of the 690 decisions that were reviewed, 50% of them were upheld. So that means that, you know, when uh, decisions were rejected, if you applied, you had a decent account of having that decision, that rejection decision upheld. But once again, it's expensive to do this. You know, as I mentioned before, the only charges to search information is prohibitive. And the framing of your question is everything. I recently tried to get information out of a government department only to be told there was nothing there. And often you feel that you have to know exactly what it is that you are looking for. And the very reason why you are looking is to get that information. But, you know, um, they'll often uh, tell you that it might take 600 hours to search something and it's going to cost, you know, $10,000. You know, who can afford to do this? And again, you know, seeking reviews to NCAT usually involves hiring a lawyer. And I think most people just give up when it gets to, to that point. And I think as Anne was saying before, I think that they rely on this, you know, in, in you know, making it difficult. But, you know, the other thing that I think is of immense frustration is dealing with local government. Now in 2019, uh, legislation was passed requiring local governments to put on their website the pecuniary interests of their councillors. Now, I can't tell you how many times, you know, I have searched through the, uh, the, the, the byways of the local council website. It's hard enough to even find who their local councillors are, let alone to find, um, you know, where their pecuniary interest declarations are. So, then you uh, ring the local government department. Often they have no idea that they have, um, you know, GIPA requirements to complete. And only recently I was told that, no, I couldn't access uh, this information. And I said, yes, you have a legislative requirement to pass me that. And they said, no, our you know, our rule is that we have to, you know, look after the privacy of our councillors. And I said, well, actually, no, you know, we have a right. So after a fight and speaking to um, a, a more senior person, I was allowed to have access, but I had to get there in person to do it. So that was an hour's drive. And once I got there, they handed me the documents. And once again, they said, you can only write by hand. Now, given the council <laughs> that I was looking at had pages and pages of uh, property interests and companies that he was involved in, that took forever. But look, at, at least I got it. But it was no thanks to the people in control of such information. And as journalists, we often joke that it should be freedom from information. So I just think that there are, you know, so many things that could be improved. And also as technology has, um, you know, it, it has gone along in leaps and bounds, it's much easier for governments to search the information that you require. 
but I just think at the same time, you know, roadblocks are just constantly thrown in the way of journalists to stop them getting the information. And I would just hate to be a member of the public trying to do the same thing. But um, thanks very much and happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Kate. And um, it's really great to get a picture of some of the day-to-day -day frustrations of doing the great works that you do. Um, it makes it even more valuable to, to us readers. Um, we've got a couple of questions from the audience um, and I've got some as well. The first one's for you, Anne, and, and I mean, you mentioned it briefly around the courts being basically the only way to review an archive decision. But the question is, who, does, who do the National Archives report to and um, expanding on that, what accountability mechanisms are there to review those decisions apart from going to the court? Uh, well, they, they technically account to their minister. Um, one of the problems is whoever the minister is just keeps changing around all the time. So when I first put in that letter about the, you know, the Kerr Palace documents, it got sent to like four different people before anyone could figure out who was actually in charge <laughs> of the archives. Um, so most of the time, the minister who's in charge of the archives doesn't even know it. So sometimes they're in the arts department, sometimes they're in the attorney general's department, you know, they just get shoved around all over the place. And that's sort of indicative of the, the, the level of engagement with them. Um, yes, um, uh, you know, in the end to bring them to account, you really do have to go to court and it does cost a huge amount of money. I mean, Jenny Hocking did the whole crowdfunding business to do it. I just don't, I couldn't do that. I, don't, I, I couldn't take money from people to, to, to satisfy my curiosity. I think I'd find that too hard. Um, but, you know, really, what else do you do? I mean, and, and it is terrible. I, I, when it comes to things like FOI as well, I've also had fights um, like um, Kate has. I've been on both sides of the um, um, bench in FOI because I used to actually administer FOI for New South Wales when I worked in the New South Wales Cabinet Office. And I did it properly so that when people asked for stuff and it was embarrassing, I let it out because I said to them, it's the law. And when someone from the minister's office tried to bully me and said, you can't let that out, I just said, it's the law. <laughs> Are you telling me to break the law? And then they I wish you still worked there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, uh, yeah. And, and the other one I was just going to mention briefly is what, what Kate said about the handwriting thing. Oh, my God. Worst archive ever. Windsor Castle. First of all, really hard to get into it. Secondly, they lock you up in a room while you do your research with the documents. You're not even allowed to go out to the toilet until you get accompanied out by someone at lunchtime, okay? And then you have to go back in. And so you have to sit with your legs crossed the whole time and you're only allowed to write your, your um, things down. So if you want to find most paranoid archi archive in the world, Windsor Castle wins the prize for that one. But so local government bad, Windsor Castle worse. <laughs> um, anyway, I'll let you get back to questions. Thank you. This is one for both of you um, around some of the excuses that are made um, in hiding information. Anne's talked about ongoing sensitivities. I know that national security is used often with FOI um, and some of those redactions. But, um, yeah, the question for both of you is... Do you think there's any legal basis for some of those generalist um, national security sensitivity type excuses? Um, and what can be done to um, kind of rein in that over use of those terms? Well, I, I was just thinking of what Anne was saying before about um, the, the often quoted, um, you know, national security, etc. But because you don't have the information, it's really hard to successfully argue because you haven't seen what it is that there. It's a, it's a circular argument, and I think that that's often used successfully to try to block access to information and again you have to fight a big battle to get it you have to go you know up to um, a, a higher authority and that costs time and money 
Mm. And you need to, you, what you do need is some genuinely independent person you know, of the status of like an ombudsman or whatever to oversee it. Um, with the archives, there just isn't one that does that. Um, but, you know, Office of Information Commissioner, Freedom of Information Commissioner, I mean, you know, in the past, there have been some quite good ones who have overturned government decisions. So it's really important to have that. I should mm. say one of the um, biggest um, blockages that I often get uh, uh, is um, the stuff about what's personal confidential information. Yeah. Mm. So <laughs> I once asked for under freedom of information all the letters by which prime minister in terms of you know my resignation and does that include the resignation of the whole cabinet and so I was getting a collection of them to write an article about them well for the more recent ones they actually asked the relevant prime ministers because they whether to let it out and one of them refused and I'm saying and they said it was personal I said how can it be personal and private if it's a letter resigning your position as prime minister, surely there is nothing more public than that. I mean, everybody knows you resign, right? Um, and so in the end, the government said, okay, well, well, we'll offer you a compromise. We will read the letter to you so you can hear what's in it. And they did. And it was a standard one that everybody else writes. But you ask yourself, what did the relevant prime minister do to the letter to make it so bad that he couldn't let it out? Did he doodle sort of, you know, little drawings on the end or write rude words on the side or something? I mean, I don't know. But again, in terms of ridiculous answers, um, how a um, resignation as prime minister letter um, can be classified as something personal and private business of the person of the prime minister concerned is completely beyond me. Thanks, and I think and that leads on well to an ombudsman type idea, an oversight idea, and it might be one that would work around some of the costs that Kate is talking about and some of the hurdles, I guess, um, but also some of the excuses that go out. At, do you have any thoughts? This is a question for both of you around thoughts around an extended information commissioner um, that does oversight of these kind of things or is there legislative change that's needed? Oh, well, I think they definitely need one. And, and, you know, there was a huge scandal some time back where they just starved the poor person who held the position from having um, any money, any office, anything at all. Um, uh, they couldn't get rid of them legislatively because they'd have to get it through the Senate. And so they just sort of, you know, um, got to the point where it was some poor person working out of the spare room of their home. Um, uh, so if you do these things, like all accountability agencies, they need to be properly funded. And this is the biggest flaw in the entire system is that governments hate accountability agencies. Look what they're doing to the Auditor General. It's an absolute travesty. Look what they've been doing to ICAC in terms of starving it with from funds. Um, all of these bodies, the more successful they are in bringing governments to account, the more governments starve them as fun with, from funds in order to stop them from doing their job. Um, and so if you really wanted to reform things properly, what you do need is some kind of separate independent funding system that is not easily affected by politicians. And I don't know how you do that, but if you could, if you could crack that one, uh, that would make a major contribution to mm. Australia. We're looking at doing some research into that area around some kind of independent tribunal for funding of accountability institutions. So I'd love your thoughts on that when we get to it. Kate, do you have anything to add to that? Like what could be done to curtail the costs and is, is there an oversight mechanism that would help? Well, there is, um, um, look, Anne will correct me on this, but I thought there was a, 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 um, an information um, commissioner but I don't know whether they're they just ha they have an, just an oversight and not an actual hands-on ability to uh, look at all these things. But it is um, it's it's a continual frustration that you rely on the individual person handling a GIPA um, application. I recently did one, and they just said, um, "There's no information there," and I had an insider saying to me, this is where you'll find it. This is how to frame the question. I reframed it and sent it in again, and I was knocked back. 
Mm-hmm. And they just said there's no there's no information there. And on other occasions, they've said, as Anne pointed out, um, that oh the person um, is personal information there, and so therefore that information has been blocked. You don't know what the personal information is, or why it's been blocked, or whether it's been justified. But again, I think that they are relying on it's so hard, it's so time consuming that you will just pack up and go away. Mm. I just think if if there was better education of the people in those organisations who are handling those roles, and, and Anne said it is the law, but it's very hard to police the interpretation of that law when you only when you can't get to see what it is that you're looking for. Mm. There's a couple of questions around um, technology and we've touched on this briefly, but um, one example from New Zealand, which makes covenant documents available on the web soon after decisions. Um, And I think, you know, in political donations, there's a lot of um, jurisdictions doing, um, you know, live reporting of political donations. So just any thoughts on the, the, the potential for technology to to make access to information uh, more accessible. Oh, look, I I would just like to chip in on the, we really need real time uh, reporting of political donations. Like as it stands now, they're only, um, you know, released at uh, certain times and often um, it's a year or so since an election. So you can't actually look at who was donating at the time or how close it might have been to a particular decision that was being made and also I don't know whether anyone's tried to look recently but if you try to see who is donating at a local government level even at state political levels what the parties are doing is that they're channeling all the donations into head office so you can't see whether the, you know, the, the local person who's trying to get a, you know, a development up in a, a certain area has donated to a local government councillor because it's channeled through to head office. And I just think that is absolutely outrageous and both parties do it. And that's something that definitely mm. needs. And our yeah, national I, I Commonwealth donation the, laws. Of- Sorry, and you go. Yeah, no, I was just saying I, I agree. And the other key thing about it is you need to make it easily searchable. So often, the, you know, they'll have these databases and it's impossible to search them in any rational way. And you also need to have the right level of information recorded um, because, you know, there are various ways of hiding who you are. And so you need sort of sufficient information to be able to chase things up. So there's a lot that could be done to improve um, political donation records. Um, and again, it's usually not in the interests of politicians who do it. And that's one of the things that makes it so difficult. Yeah. Mm. We're running out of time, but I'd like to thank you both um, for your insight and um, important summary of some of the issues that are faced when accessing government information. I think it's great to get both the systemic level, but also the day-to-day level of handwriting notes and um, driving around the city. (laughs) That paints a really good picture of the the struggle that you both go to to get information out, which we're grateful for. Um, This is our uh, Strangling Accountability webinar for people who've just joined. Um, The Centre for Public Integrity runs these periodically. Um, uh, And we run a project around accountability institutions, which this work fits into. um, And we will be looking at funding for accountability institutions in the lead up to the budget, which you can look up up for, um, and also uh, ways to improve scrutiny of of government decisions. So keep in touch with our work. Um, Do you guys have anything final to add before we clock off? No. I'm fine. Oh, thanks so much for your time. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Anne, and thanks for your support. Thanks so much, Hannah, and thank you. Thanks, Kate, for joining. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Pleasure.